welcome. Wait one while we finish refueling. We're almost fully tanked, so it should just be another minute or two. Disconnect now. Here we go. Disconnecting. Throttling back to fall away. And we're good. Well, we've got another great day to be in the air. So, once again, hello and welcome. In this training flight, you'll be introduced to the ANAPG-63's TWS, or track wall scan, mode. We'll also take a closer look at the VSD and what it is telling us. But first, let's review. In your first training flight, you learned about our radar's long-range scan mode. You learned that it's also referred to as the range wall scan, or RWS mode. I'll be referring to it as RWS from now on, and the reason should become abundantly clear in a few more minutes. And there's our tanker falling away behind us, and Mount Elbrus in the distance. And let's turn off our nav lights. Okay, during that first training flight, you saw the RWS mode in action. Using it, you can instantly recognize a friendly from a potentially hostile contact. Once again, friendlies are represented as circles, and all other aircraft are represented as dashes. Also, range while scan mode graphically displays the range and azimuth of all contact. For instance, this guy is about 60 nautical miles away and roughly 50 degrees to the left of our nose. 50 degrees to the left of our nose? Yes. Remember that the normal radar scan is 60 degrees to either side of center line. This line here represents 30 degrees of sweep. This one, 60. The contact is here or about 50 degrees to the left of our nose. Another way of expressing it is to say that the angle off is 50L or 50 degrees left. So we instantly have range in azimuth by simply looking at the VSD. Using the angle off, we can calculate the contact's bearing. For instance, this contact's bearing is 270. Our heading is 320. The angle off is 50L. Since these two are left, we subtract 50 from our heading of 320 to get 270. If he were to our right, we'd be adding the azimuth rather than subtracting it. Whether you add or subtract is pretty easy to understand. Think of a compass rose. If you are moving left or counterclockwise around it, the numbers are getting smaller. If you are moving to the right, they are getting bigger. So, if he's to the left, you subtract. If to the right, you add. And by playing a bit with the antenna elevation, we can get an estimate of his altitude as well. Without locking him, we can narrow in on it by slewing the scan cone up and down. Watch where he disappears and reappears. He's above 12,000 feet and below 18,000 feet. Let's say his altitude is 15,000. So, in RWS mode, we instantly have range and bearing information for any contact we see, and with an additional bit of radar antenna work, we can get an altitude estimate as well. So, we know where he is in terms of bearing, range, and altitude, and we can pass that information on to someone else. One way of doing that is a BRA call, B-R-A, Bearing Range Altitude. Let's see. Our heading is now about 312 degrees. He's still 50 left at about 42 nautical miles. So, a BRA call on this contact would be Springfield BRA, 262, 42, medium. Springfield is our call sign. The contact's bearing is 262 degrees, and his range is 42 nautical miles. The words degrees and nautical miles are inferred, and his altitude block is medium. Different fighter communities may define low, medium, and high differently, but generally the low altitude block runs from 0 to 11,999 feet. The medium altitude block runs from 12,000 to 19,999 feet, and the high block is 20,000 feet and above. 
that's good for an initial contact report, but does little to put a missile into the air. Enter the STT or single target track mode. While in it, you get a wealth of additional information beyond just bearing, range, and altitude about the STT target. But at the same time, the rest of the sky in front of you goes blank. That's because our radar dish must continually point at the target and is no longer free to scan the rest of the sky. Here's what's happening. All air-to-air -air missiles need a solid roadway of reflected energy to hit the intended target. Otherwise, they just aren't accurate enough. The most common type of missile, SARH Semi-Active Radar Homing, doesn't have a radar transmitter of its own. Instead, our onboard radar, the ANAPG-63, provides the radar energy for the Sarah Seeker housed, in our case, either an AIM-7 or AIM-120, to follow. When we lock a target and enter STT mode, our radar switches from pulse to continuous wave and we bathe the target in a steady stream of radar energy. To do so, however, our old-style dish radar, more on this later, must continually point at the target. Otherwise, our missile won't track so we can no longer keep track of the rest of the sky and all other contacts are lost. Now, some of that energy bounces off the target and reflects back in the direction of the missile's seeker head. The missile tracks that reflected energy and follows that roadway of reflections right back to the target. But, wouldn't it be great if you could have the best of both worlds? What if we could keep the situational awareness provided by the RWS mode with its range and azimuth information on all contacts, add instant access to contact altitudes, and finally have an indication of every contact's direction of flight? Well, we can. It's called TWS or Track While Scan mode. Once you are in BVR mode with the radar turned on, you enter it by pressing the Alt-I key combination. Notice that TWS appears in the lower left corner of the VSD. And look at the wealth of information we have on our contacts. Let's freeze this. We know whether or not they are friendly by the circle or dash, their range and azimuth, their altitudes as displayed directly above them. 19,000, 14,000, 15,000, 17,000, and 15,000 feet. Just add three zeros to the number displayed. And their general direction of flight, as indicated by the line extending from the circle or dash. Think of the line as the contact's nose. And we're back in real time. With the radar in TWS mode, you can scan the block of sky your radar is set to scan, but you can also get added information without locking a target. And, even more importantly, you can put a missile into the air from this mode without an STT lock. Doing that, however, takes a special type of missile, an ARH, Active Radar Homing, missile. In our case, that missile is the AIM-120 AMRAAM, Advanced Medium Range Air-to-Air -air Missile. Within the United States Air Force community, it's commonly referred to as the Slammer. Unlike SARA missiles, such as the AIM-7, an ARH missile has a radar transmitter of its own. The Slammer's radar, however, is necessarily small and much less powerful than the radar in our aircraft. So it needs to be within 8.5 nautical miles of the target to see it. When launching one BVR, we do the work for the missile and keep track of the target's location, altitude, speed, and direction of travel. Just prior to launch, our aircraft sends that information via data link to the missile's inertial navigation system. Its INS, with periodic in-flight updates, then guides it to the right piece of sky. The goal is to place the missile in the target's neighborhood and facing in the right direction, so that when its continuous wave radar goes active, the target will be in the missile's basket or its seeker's field of view. When that happens, the missile is said to have gone pitbull. That is, it is tracking on its own. So far, we've been heads down in the cockpit looking at the VSD, so now let's take a quick look at the uh, TWS HUD. As you can see, it's the same HUD you get when you enter RWS mode with an AIM-120 selected. It's the Slammer's visual mode. That's because TWS mode is not a targeting mode per se. Like RWS, it's a search mode, but with value added. To launch a missile from RWS mode, you would bug the target and enter STT mode. To launch an AIM-120 from TWS mode, however, you simply bug the target. Like this. Okay, let's freeze this. Okay, he just became our primary designated target, or PDT. 
And on the VSD, you see the same information you'd have in an STT lock. We could enter an STT lock if we wanted by bugging him a second time, but that would work to our disadvantage. First, everything else on our VSD would disappear except for him. So our situational awareness would begin to deteriorate. But second, his raw would be screaming at him that he's just been locked. But by being in TWS mode and just bugging him the once by pressing the tab key one time, as far as he's concerned, we're still in search mode. And when we launch, he won't get a launch warning either. His first warning will be when the AIM-120 is on his doorstep and goes active. And while we're still paused, let's take a look at the HUD. This all looks very familiar. You see something similar with an STT lock. Here's the steering dot, the solid circle. Here's a representation of the target bug with its angle offline, giving you an idea of its aspect. Here's the target designation box surrounding the target range scale inside the altitude tape, and the DLZ. The selected missile, how many we have remaining, our airspeed expressed as Mach, the G-loading on our aircraft, the primary designated targets, uh, airspeed expressed as Mach, and on the lower right, the range to the PDT, currently 40 nautical miles, nav data, aspect angle, and finally something different. As with the AIM-7, this is a countdown timer. But with the AIM-7, it was designated with a T, and it was the time to missile minimum range. With the AIM-120, it's expressed as an M, and it's counting down the time until the current target is within range of the next AIM-120's radar. And since that next missile will always be attached to our wing, it's really counting down the time until you can launch that missile in visual mode again against the current target. Okay, back to the VSD in real time. Here's the primary designated target, or PDT, just disappearing behind the steering dot, and since in TWS mode, our radar can provide steering information to four missiles at the same time, you can designate a primary and three secondary targets. Here's one, two, and three secondaries. Notice the numerical designation that appeared next to each. If you try to bug a fifth target, however, your original primary is undesignated and the primary slips to the next one in line. When that happens, your best option is simply to turn off your radar and then re-enter TWS mode. From there, reorder in the sequence you want. But remember, you have a maximum of four. So, I want this guy first in the sequence. Now one, two, and three additional. And here you can get a good look at the PDT. It looks identical to the uh, STT lock target, and you have much the same information on the screen. Now these guys are all more or less at the same altitude, but they're all actually a bit below us. We're flying at around 20,000 feet. They're down around 15,000. And since we can't increase the number of bars scanned in the vertical, we need to be careful. Keep marching the TDC down along with the targets. And while you do, keep an eye on the altitudes we're actually scanning at that range. In fact, it's a good idea to drop your TDC down to about where you plan to launch and take a look at the uh, altitude readings. And by the time they get down there, they're going to be pretty close to the bottom edge of our scan zone, so let's move our scan zone down to keep them more towards the middle. The primary target is already within launch range, although I'm still holding off and waiting until he's well inside of range. We now have the ASE circle. The idea, of course, is always to keep that steering dot inside the ASE circle. Okay, and all four contacts are now within launch range. The first two are about midway to RTR, so FOX 3. And I'm going to freeze this. I want to point out two things on the VSD. The first is the countdown timer at the bottom of the display right here, M, and showing 8 seconds. In another 8 seconds, we'll be able to pit bull the current selected slammer against the current selected target. And now look at the top of the VSD right here. This timer is displaying two numbers. The first, in this case a 5, is indicating the number of seconds until the onboard radar of the last missile fired goes active. 
And the second number in the sequence, in this case 21, is the time remaining until the last missile you put into the air reaches its target. So if you put multiple missiles into the air in fairly short sequence, you'll see those numbers change as each subsequent missile is launched. At all times, it's displaying the information for the last missile you launched. And now back to real time. Watch the numbers change. Box 3. Five seconds to active for missile 2, 4, 3, 2, Pitbull. Twelve seconds before we can go visual mode on this guy here, 11. Missile 2 has gone active, so now we're getting information on missile 3, which is still on our rail. Box 3. Well, now it's not. Box 3. Four missiles launched. The last one goes active in three, two, one, Pitbull. Now let's go back and watch the same sequence through the HUD. Large ASE circle, target box, the star under the target box indicating that we are within launch range. 13 seconds remaining to visual mode. Range to the current missile's target in nautical miles. Target about halfway to the RTR mark. Box three. Six seconds to active. Target box shifted to the second target. Fox 3. Notice the timer shifted to the second missile. Four seconds to active. Three, two. Target box now surrounding the third target. Banking left to place my nose between the two in trail. Fox 3. Fox 3. Five seconds to active on the last missile. The first two targets have flown below our radar scan zone. That's why it's now defaulted to target three as the PDT. And that's why the target box is shifted to where it has. Oop, just lost that target. Target box on the last designated target, and he's gone too, below our radar. But all missiles had gone active, and... One... Two... And three. And four. Not bad, four for four. But, as you can see, not without some effort on our part. Even with as little as 5,000 feet in elevation difference between us and the targets, we needed to be very aware of our scan zone elevation as the range closed. In this situation, we had to keep slowing it down. That's because the closer you are to our aircraft, the less coverage our radar actually has. While this graphic isn't to scale, it'll give you the general idea. Out here at 40 nautical miles, our four bar scan covers quite a bit of altitude. But as the range shrinks, so does the altitude coverage. So finally, if you don't adjust the scan height, you will lose the contact. And the smaller the range, the more aggressive you have to be in making those adjustments, because your scan volume keeps getting smaller and smaller, and the margin for error grows less and less. And once the range closes to within 10 nautical miles, it becomes a very difficult task. Before we continue, I want to take a minute or two to talk a bit more about the radar in our nose. This sim models the Hughes AN-APG-63, the first generation of this radar. It's been out of production since 1986, but about 700 are still operational in F-15As, Bs, and early C models in Ds, operated by the U.S. Air Force and the Air Forces of Israel, Japan, and Saudi Arabia. In the 1980s, Hughes redesigned the APG-63. This was the APG-70 that went into later model F-15CD aircraft. Raytheon bought Hughes in the 1990s, and future upgrades went back to the uh, APG-63 nomenclature. First came the APG-63-V1. This was followed by the APG-63-V2. The 63-V2 represented a major upgrade to the system. The V2 is an ASA, Active Electronically Scanned Array, radar, which represents a huge jump in technology. It has an exceptionally agile beam that provides near-instantaneous track updates and no longer uses the old hydraulic big-dish technology that's still on our nose. The current generation of this radar is the APG-63-V3, even better than the V2. So, the radar in our nose is five generations removed from current technology. 
also, I suspect that the SIM mismodels some aspects of the uh, radar we do have. As you've no doubt noticed, we can't adjust the number of vertical scan bars. I suspect, but don't know for certain, that the original APG-63 had the capability of doing so, at least in a narrower 30-degree scan. And that would allow you to uh, adjust the radar scan for a aircraft formation that was separated in the vertical rather than horizontal. But we don't have that. So all this means that you just have to work harder. And speaking of working harder, let's get back to work. Okay, there's another group of aircraft out here. Somewhere. There they are, just starting to show up on the VSD at 40 nautical miles. This guy's a bit above us at 29,000 feet. Ah, more joining the party. Notice that they're separated in altitude. This should be fun. With the last group, once the range closed uh, to about 10 nautical miles, we had some real issues with just 5,000 feet worth of vertical separation. And now we're we'll be dealing with 15,000 feet. Well, there's one of them leaving contrails in the sky. Should be easy enough to keep track of him. Ah, looks like a party of four. Two at roughly 15,000 feet, one at 25, and one at 30. Once the range closes, there'll be no way of keeping them all on the scope with only four bars of vertical scan. So, what to do? Well, we'll have to deal with the two flight levels separately. So, PDT on the 30,000 footer, second primary on the one at 24. And we'll descend to about 15,000 feet. And as I do so, I'll be keep, I'll slew the uh, scan zone up and down. I want to keep track of these guys and make sure that uh, nobody's shifting altitudes on me. Okay, as you can see, at 20 nautical miles, I'm having trouble keeping everybody on the scope. So once we're down to around 15,000 feet, and the two at higher altitude are within launch range, I'll focus solely on them, launch against them, then we'll recenter the radar, and the two at lower altitude which should be right at our flight level and right in front of us. Okay, let's get the two at higher altitude back. There we are. He's our PDT and our secondary. Fox three. First missile counting down to active two one. Fox three. Eight seconds till it goes active. Recenter the radar with control I. So now we're scanning directly ahead of us again, and there are the two guys at our flight level, 15,000 feet. Would you like to dance? You can be my primary, and you can be my secondary. Fox 3. Hit on the guy at 30,000. Another hit straight ahead. Fox 3. Our last missile on its way. Debris falling all around us ahead and off to our left. That hits 1, 2, and 3. One missile still in the air with no more missiles on our rails. We've lost, also lost the uh, missile timer. And I'm not sure if our missile has missed him or just hasn't arrived on target yet. Switching to guns. And there he goes. Boom. So, once again, we're four for four. I guess we won't need guns after all. And there's the impact from one. And another flaming hole in the ground. So, as you can see, you have far more trouble keeping track of everyone with multiple aircraft if they're split in altitude. But nevertheless, we are 8 for 8, and now it's time to head for home. And as we do, there are a few more things I'd like to pass on to you before we close. 
Until now, our training has focused on learning the RWS, TWS, and STT modes of the AN-APG-63 radar in our nose. In our next training flight, however, we will face opponents who can both jam our radar and shoot back. You will learn the language and geometry of intercepts. So, before we end this flight, I'd like us to take another look at the VSD in preparation for our next flight. As you know, the VSD gives you a top-down view of the sky ahead of your aircraft. It's important to realize, however, that this top-down view is not a God's eye view. The distinction is an important one. The VSD is presenting you with a two-dimensional graph of the pyramidal shaped piece of sky our radar is searching. The narrow end of our radar scan zone is at our nose, while the wide end is ranging away from our aircraft. That's why it's more difficult to keep our radar in contact with a bogey that's neither co-altitude nor head-on as the range closes. So our radar is searching a pyramidal piece of sky, but the VSD is representing that pyramid as a square. Remember at the start of this mission when we tracked the contact out at about 50 degrees on the VSD? You got a hint of this then. The angle off remained 50 degrees, even as the range closed. The apparent angle between our nose and the contact displayed on the VSD grew wider, but the angle off remained the same. That's because the screen is displaying a square graph of our scan zone's pyramid. The 30-degree line on the VSD, for example, is this 30-degree line on the diagram. And the 60-degree line is this one. Now, you may have already figured out where this is going. Let's say that you picked up a contact at 60 nautical miles on the 50-degree line. You're watching the range close. 40 nautical miles, 20 nautical miles, 10 nautical miles, no nautical miles. He's here on the VSD. If this were a God's eye view, he'd be somewhere in the distance off your left wing. But it's not. It's a graphical representation of your pyramidal shaped scan zone. He won't be here. He'll be here at 50 degrees left. And if you and he are at the same altitude, he'll be about to fly through your canopy. By the way, your canopy rail falls at roughly 30 degrees left and right of your nose. So 60 degrees right or left is about halfway between the canopy rail and your wing. If you're ever trying to get a visual on a contact, it helps to know where to look. Okay. So, with all this in mind, if you ever watch a contact march down the display as the range closes and he is neither moving in toward the center of the screen nor moving out towards its edge, you are on a collision course. You have no horizontal separation. If you have any separation at all, it's in the vertical. If you happen to be at the same altitude as well, well, then he'll be passing through your cockpit. Keep that in mind. The VSD will show you where he is, but it's not a God's eye view. If you remember that when we start running intercepts, things will make much more sense. And there's one last thing that I'd like to discuss prior to completing this training flight. It also concerns the VSD, or more specifically, the aspect angle figure you see when either in an STT lock on a target or you bug a target in TWS mode. And there's a bug in the sim, or rather an improper calculation. The number you're seeing there is not actually the aspect angle. Rather, it's what naval aviation refers to as the degrees to go, and the Air Force refers to as the heading cross angle. It's the number of degrees you have to turn, and the direction you have to turn in, right or left, to make the target's heading your own. Take a look at the diagram. This is the angle that ought to be displayed which is the aspect angle. Instead, what's displayed is this angle here. Fortunately, all is not lost. There's a rhyme and reason to intercept geometry. The number you're given is the heading cross angle. If you take the angle off and add it to the heading cross angle, you'll end up with the aspect angle. We'll talk about this in much more depth in our next training flight. But until then, just keep in mind these last two notes I've given you on the VSD. Oh, and one last thing. I'm curious. Raise your hand if you know what the letter designation ANAPG actually stands for. No? Okay. Back in February of 1943, the U.S. began using a universal system to identify various radar variants, among other things, consisting of three letters and a number. 
These are the platform, equipment type, function, and version number. The prefix AN refers to a multi-service designation of Army Navy. What follows the slash is first the platform type, A for aircraft. Next is equipment type, or P for radar. You would think that it would be R, but R was already taken by radio. And the function type, G for fire control. The 63, of course, is where it stands in the version line. Just wanted to pass that on. It's a bit of trivia that you can use to impress your friends. That's it for now. Thank you. You have control.